So first of all, good afternoon, everyone, for those of you in the UK time zone or wherever you are. Welcome to this 10th episode of the Social Leadership Webinar Podcast presented by Julian Stodd, who you can perhaps see uh, just beside me on the camera. Um, this is, as I mentioned, the 10th episode in this series that Julian's been presenting around social leadership. Today, Julian's going to be talking about social capital. Uh, and this is following on from the last uh, episode of the webinar, which was around co-creation. Uh, the session will take an hour. Um, just a quick bit of housekeeping is that we are recording this session uh, and the session will be available on YouTube in the coming hours or days. So if you'd like to catch up on this um, webinar or any of the previous ones, they're all available for you. If you just search out for Sea Salt Learning and we'll be in touch uh, with a, a link via email after the session. And I think that's it from me, other than to say that there is a chat window that you can use throughout today's session. Uh, if you've got any questions uh, or queries for Julian, please feel free to jot those ideas down there. If you make sure that you've sent a message to all panellists and attendees, uh, then we'll be able to see that. So with no further ado, I will hand over to the host of today's session, Julian Stodd. Hi, Julian. Hello. Right, can you hear me okay? Loud and clear, thank you. Excellent. Okay, well, thank you everybody for joining. Thank you, Sam, for the introduction. Um, and here we are to explore social capital in social leadership, which is quite, um, it's quite an interesting one, actually. It's one of my favourite aspects of social leadership, but I'd also probably say it's the aspect which uh, I'm kind of still thinking about the most. It's still very much uh, emergent. Uh, all of my work tends to be shared in the, the mindset of working out loud, of, um, of evolving the work as we go. And the notion of social capital is certainly something which um, continues to, uh, to flow around my thinking. So today I'm going to be sharing some of the more established parts of that work and then also perhaps uh, some of the newer thinking and newer ideas that, uh, that I've been developing around that. So let me just start here. here we Sam said this is number 10 in the series. I'd just like to uh, put that in context really. Um, this is the full series of 12 webinars that we're running through. Um, all the earlier ones are available on, on YouTube. If, if you uh, don't get uh, put off by today, you can check back on any of those ones. And we're here nearing the end uh, thinking about social capital. Um, the warning that I put up is that uh, for me, these are these are working out loud sessions. So this is not a um, formal presentation about social leadership. This is very much sharing the evolving and ongoing thinking around the subject. So, you know, co-creative, feel free to, to chip in. I can see questions or comments as we go um, and I'll respond to those if anything comes up and we'll, uh, we'll see where we get to. And reflective because, well, the gift of reflection, I suppose, the chance to um, take a bit of time out of our every day and just think about these things can be, can be quite valuable. Um, I'm going to be sharing some new material with you today. Um, quite a lot of it actually I'm sharing for the very first time so uh, I'll, I'll flag some of those slides perhaps as we go through it. Um, particularly I'm sharing a dozen or so images from the new 100 days uh, book which is um, which is the 100 days uh, journey and uh, Hilton's asking there does this have a context with your book? Yeah it's, it follows along so the the social leadership handbook outlined the um, framework of the the social leadership journey and the hundred days book is is sort of practical development guide so it's we're certainly aligned in in that sense so um i like to i don't use many slides with text on in fact this uh this will be the only one that has text rather than image on but i, I sometimes like to just think about um I guess the definition, normally I describe social capital as the ability to survive and thrive in the social age, the, the widest context for, um, for all of my work is, is that new reality that we live in, the evolved nature of work, the rise of social collaborative technologies, the democratization of communication and creativity. Um, so I'm sticking with that definition as a foundational one, your own ability to survive but not just survive, to thrive in these new spaces. That's one measure of social capital. 
obviously there are a number of different fields that use that term social capital from sociology and um, and uh, even uh, crops up in cognitive psychology and all sorts of places but I, I, I use it really in that context of our ability to survive and thrive but it goes beyond that so in the context of social leadership um, which is leadership outside of uh, any formal authority that's given to us uh, it very much governs our mindset and ability to support others as they navigate this new space so I want to capture both of those aspects our individual ability to thrive and our ability to support others to thrive it might be worth um, just revisiting that foundational definition of social leadership. So formal leadership is that which is given to us by the organisation. If you sit within a hierarchy, um, if you have power that has been given to you by somebody, and if you're able to exert that power and control over somebody else because of your position in the system, then that's really formal leadership. Social leadership probably the simplest definition is reputation-based authority. So whilst formal leadership can be given to you, social leadership can only ever be earned. You can't buy social leadership and you can't uh, demand it either. You can only earn it through, through building your, your reputation over time. Um, in the sort of process of, of writing the last book and just in thinking about it, I've also added in two other contexts which I'll touch on a little bit today. One is this notion of responsibility, so our individual and our corporate, um, so individual and organisational responsibility to our communities. Now it always sort of makes me laugh, one of the um, earliest reviews of the Social Leadership Handbook said uh, despite the author's obvious um, liberal tendencies, it's, it's quite a useful framework and I thought well you know liberal tendencies are one thing but I, I think that um it's more than that we we do see in the social age this evolved relationship between organization and uh, its wider community and hence between individual organization and wider community um and that's expressed in many uh different ways we, we've seen the rise of the the social hero leader so individuals with high social authority and reputation who lead formal organizations but who hold much of the value of the brand in their individual uh, reputation and engagement and with that uh, I need to do something with it so um, we, we, we see that played out in Australia at the moment for example the chief exec of Qantas which is the uh, airline has come out publicly to say I as an individual and we as an organization support marriage equality and that's quite interesting because um, on the one hand, Qantas is an airline business. It, 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 its main concern should be about running airlines, ensuring that you get a decent meal, um, you know, and they don't fall out of the sky. So on the one hand, he's been attacked for moving outside his remit as the chief exec of that organisation. But his language, his rationalisation is interesting. He said, as, a, as an employer, as part of our community, we have a responsibility to fight for fairness, you know, to, to, to push for something that just should be right. And, and that really speaks of the wider context of organisations in the social age and, of course, the wider risk for organisations. Organisations that fail to be socially engaged can pay quite a heavy price for it. So I've included that in and, and this imperative for social justice and fairness. And, and I indeed, I, I say in the early stages of the book, you know, the primary role of um, a social leader is to fight for fairness not because it's a, a nice layer to add on top of things not because it's just a, a soft measure that you can add to things but because it's a it's a hard measure you know be, being fair is a significant um, factor in people's decision to go and work for a company so to attract the best talent to have high levels of engagement and to be effective we need an organization which is fair which does the right thing so we'll explore uh, a little bit of those uh, those aspects today. I thought I'd start with this slide, which uh, almost runs the risk of being uh, a bit too trite to say, you know, social leaders do what's right, not just what's easy. Well, it kind of is trite, but it's uh, it's also quite significant. Formal leaders, so leaders in an organization may well strive to do what's right, but ultimately at some point they kind of do what they have to do because 
um, there's always a gap between individual imperative and, uh, and organizational imperative. And um, sometimes in our formal role, we, we make judgments and we play things off. It's, it's impossible to hold all parties uh, to equal account in our decision making in a formal role. But in social leadership, because it's this reputation based authority, because the ultimate judgment is applied not by the organization and some kind of formal review, but by how the community holds you. I think that um, social leaders uh, you know, have to do what's right, even when that takes them into conflict with the organization. And you can probably already sense there's a tension there. Um, and, and that's something I'm acutely aware of when you work with organizations, you know, they say, well, can you come in and talk to us about social leadership? And the first thing you say is social leaders do what's right, even when it takes them into conflict with the organization. You, know, you can start a panic like, well, we don't want our leaders, by which they mean our formal leaders, to start, you know, challenging the, 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 the hierarchy of the organization and, and um, its point. However, uh, that's really the strength of having two types of leadership, of having formal and um, a, a, and social leadership. We can, um, we have the benefit of both. You know, we have to have the perspective that's given to us uh, within the social community as well as the perspective from the formal community. Um, and that's why I wanted to use that word easy in here. Um, it's not that formal leadership is always easy, but the context in which we exercise it is generally are particularly clear um, it might not be easy to do the right thing uh, so that sometimes is the dilemma that, that social leaders will face not least because it might not be clear what the right thing is and that's often the case in um, strongly coherent cultures of an organization um, when you look at cultural constraint or cultural failure you find that it often occurs um, not because it's imposed from the outside. So many organizations are not imposed, uh, sorry, are not constrained because of external factors. They may say they don't have enough money or budget or freedom within a legislative framework. They're often more tightly constrained by internal cultural factors. And uh, the reason it's harder to change those is because um, social consequences applied. When we try to change the culture of an organization, we hit all sorts of established power and mechanisms of control. So um, I thought I'd start off with that piece, just really about the quandary of social leadership. How do we find out and do uh, what's right? Um, this, uh, again, this illustration is, um, is from the book and it's, it's uh, about standing up. <laughs> it means uh, taking a stance it, it, it's uh, you know lace up your boots put them on and 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 stand up for what's right and you know what does this mean in practice well let me give you a, a sense of it um, uh, organizations are often quite interested in um, the gender pay gap so do they pay um, women less than men uh, so purely because they're women you know is that the case there's all sorts of research about this and there's a fair amount of controversy about it so the the latest research the most credible research i've seen recently shows that at the the current rate we are closing the gender pay gap it'll be 108 years before it's closed the pace at which we are closing it is actually slowing down now um, a number of organizations i've been speaking to are doing something about this they're, they're carrying out uh, work to, to see, they're trying to tinker around the edges of it. But it's interesting that it's only in Iceland that um, the women in the country have, uh, on two occasions, uh, talked about going on strike until the pay gap is closed. So actually taking that kind of action in many contexts, in many organisations, um, gender inequality is normalised. It's just how it is. So there's an intention to do something about it. To, uh, to close the gap, but there's not actually the action required to do it. And how do you do it? Well, it, it's actually pretty simple. An organization can commission a blind study of roles and rewards. So that the research is done uh, without the researchers having the knowledge of whether someone is male or female, they can look at the roles, they look at the remuneration for it, and they can make an assessment. And then from that, an organization can take a decision either that it uplifts the pay of whoever's paid less, or it downgrades the pay of whoever's paid more. And yet, 
virtually no organizations do that because nobody stands up and says this is what's right because the, the, the high consequence of um a, a, of standing up in in that context so um that, i mean that might be a sort of extreme example but there are many everyday examples where uh, we can think in that context as a social leader how do we stand up for for what's right it's a good internal check um you remember I, I talked earlier in that in that foundational definition of social leadership about uh, your ability to survive and thrive and um i, I quite like this notion uh, forgive my uh, somewhat imperfect sketch of a swiss army knife that's what this is intended to be and uh, this was really um the thought behind this was uh, i remember the notion of uh, buying my first swiss army knife i got my first swiss army knife when i was 16 and uh, you can buy a swiss army knife with any number of blades you, ha you have to make a decision what do you want do you want a corkscrew do you want a pen do you want a magnifying glass do you want some tweezers do you want pliers you know you have to decide what you want if you've got endless money and don't mind carrying around a, a thing the size of a brick you can have it all but generally there's some kind of specialism and so that came back to me as I was thinking about this, about social capital. Um, if you are going to think about your ability to survive and thrive in the social age, in this new reality, you're going to have to think, well, you know, what, what do I need on my pen knife? What are the survival skills that I need? And, and this ties back to one of the earliest notions of social leadership, which is curation, choosing your space. Um, it's not that you can't have everything, but it might take you time to build, uh, build those skills and earn that reputation. So there's an active curatorial process of thinking, you know, what do I need? Where, um, you know, wh where am I uh, at uh, within my own skills development? Are the tools that I needed yesterday right as the tools for tomorrow? What, what I often say when I'm working with groups directly is, um, and it's a bit of a generalization the skills that we bring from the old world are 50 percent of what we need in the new world as the environment in which we we work and learn changes as the context of our organizations change as the social context around our organizations change we have to learn new things so a core skill for an individual social leader is to curate their own space ensure they have the right skills but again crucially to ensure that other people do too it's that notion of social responsibility alongside the idea of social capital. So there is a sense of the currency, but I suspect that the currency of social capital is one that is reinforced through sharing. The, um, there's a broader context for this work. Many of the um, spaces in which I'm able to work are, are global. And being global doesn't just mean uh, that you're separated by miles. As we move around the world, we're separated by legal differences. We're separated by moral and ethical differences too. So to give you a sense of that, there are uh, 79 or 80 countries in the world where homosexuality is illegal or not yet decriminalized. So uh, an individual in, in that space is operating under a, a fundamentally different legal framework and that legal framework is based on a different moral and ethical framework. Now, it's all very well and good for social collaborative technology to bring us together. Uh, and many organizations do this well. If you go to work for, for IBM or if you go and um, you know, work for Nestle, you can collaborate with your colleagues and peers around the world through various social collaborative technologies. Um, but of course, just bringing people together in a space doesn't give us cultural alignment. It doesn't overcome the fact that we are in fact uh, united around our shared differences. And what does this mean? Well, it's really about uh, how able people are to engage. Um, we often find that organizations rely on technology or try to rely on technology to solve what is essentially a social challenge, a sociological challenge. How do people come together and find shared value and shared purpose? There's a very interesting piece on the, the radio uh, to, uh, just yesterday I was listening to about a, a, a project which is bringing together in the north of England um, uh, two young girls, one from a Muslim family, one from a Christian family. 
and bringing them together out of context to explore the differences uh, that they have, their preconceptions of each other's religion and of each other's everyday reality versus um, the shared reality that they find together. And uh, it was interesting listening to an interview with the two participants in that, how they talked openly about their preconceptions and how those preconceptions had been challenged and ultimately through that process, how they found a friendship. Well, you know, that's a nice story. Uh, it's an easy thing to do. What typically happens in organizations is we're actually separated by our shared differences. There's little mechanism for bridging those. So I think one of the key roles of social leaders is to lead within those spaces to help us to capture and chart our stories of shared difference. So this comes back to a notion I explored in some depth in the storytelling webinar. And it's the notion of how social leaders um, build stories not to build consensus and uniformity. They do so to understand difference. So the point of a social leader is not to get people united around a common narrative. It's to understand and document the difference between narratives. So it's a core social role to do with cohesion um, within the group. I, I find that our, our shared differences are, are, are really quite fascinating. It speaks to the um, vast complexity of social systems. Uh, if you're interested in that, um, there's some writing on the blog around uh, radical complexity. If you search for that article, it explores how different systems scale. And I'm particularly interested at the moment, and remember I did position this session as working out loud, so I've claimed a permission to share the sort of things I'm most interested in at the moment, um, is the difference in the way that formal and social systems scale. So remember, formal leadership happens within formal systems, and formal systems can scale infinitely. You can have, you know, 10 people, you put somebody in charge. You line up 10 of those units and you put somebody in charge of the 10 people who are in charge. You can really infinitely scale a formal system. But it turns out that social systems don't scale like that. So as the social system gets bigger, it doesn't simply gain more layers and levels. In fact, what happens is it fragments into tightly coherent subcultures which have high trust and are quite united and have mistrust between each of those separate social systems. Um, funnily enough, uh, just a couple of hours ago, I was running um, a webinar on the landscape of trust research. And what one of the early effects from that research uh, shown very clearly is the relationship between trust and hierarchy. So trust seems to flow predominantly across levels of hierarchy more than it flows up or diagonally through the hierarchy. And that really reinforces some of the um, earlier work which I've previously written about. And again, just to signpost you out to that, if you're interested in the trust work, which is a major study I'm running this year, um, if you search on the blog for trust, you'll find a whole series of writing and pieces. I think there are about 65 different articles on there now. Um, it's a very interesting and emergent uh, work. So a key role for social leaders is to help us to understand our shared differences. Now, um, I, I move from that high and lofty expectation down to a really rather um, pragmatic uh, notion of etiquette. Uh, and I'm always very careful about this. I, I, I do find reasonably often uh, when I'm talking to organizations, they, they equate social leadership with social media. And of course, this is really nothing to do with social media. Um, it may well happen that much of our social collaboration happens through technology, but the mechanism by which it happens are these mechanisms of trust and pride and community and coherence. However, it's not to say that there isn't an etiquette of using technology. So one of the, the things I'm uh, quite interested in is, uh, are the rules, the unspoken implicit rules of systems. And the reason I'm interested in that is because in the trust research, we see quite clearly when people describe the failure of trust, they talk about the breaching of implicit rules. And to give you an idea of that, I always reckon um, it took me about two years to figure out how to use Twitter. Not, to, not how to use it technically, but to have confidence that I understood the etiquette of that space. And it's very true in all sorts of online collaborative spaces that the etiquette is less clear. So we've met today in this space 
but uh, you can see me, I can't see you. So I can't read all of the normal cues that I would take, both good and bad, um, about, uh, about each other. We, 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 you know, we don't have many of the, the nonverbal cues that we would have in, in the real world. So we have to find what the etiquette is. And this ties into the point of social leaders helping others to survive and thrive. Sometimes that may be about nurturing and development and mentoring people to be engaged in these spaces. But it may also be about keeping them safe, about preventing people from, for example, sharing too much or, or being overexposed in a particular space. And this um, ties into quite an interesting notion of, of social consequence. So in our formal roles, we are, um, we are subject to formal consequence. Uh, if we do something wrong, the organization may apply consequence onto us. But in the social space, if we say something stupid or if we do something wrong, we may be subjected to social consequence, even exclusion from a community. Now, social consequence is a really um, significant factor. It's a dominant cultural effect, in fact. There's a lot of um, interesting work that's um, been done from the 50s onwards, looking at how is it that communities exhibit certain toxic behaviours when the individuals within that community wouldn't dream of doing so by themselves. You get these interesting collective effects where a culture can become quite toxic. And often it's because an individual within the community won't stand up for what's right because the social consequence of standing up is too high. So when I said earlier, a role of social leaders is to stand up, they need to build their community around them so that they will have the skill, competence and capability to stand up and to do what's right. Um, if we just rely on formal power and our role within the formal system, we know that people can be constrained within that. So understanding etiquette and helping people within our teams and communities to understand it is very important. Um, I come back to a, a, a theme which uh, again can, uh, I guess can be misunderstood. Um, humility is the foundation of social leadership. I say that not because, um, not because I'm adhering to any kind of, uh, you know, Buddhist notion of, of goodness, um, more because uh, social leaders earn reputation by helping others to succeed. They don't earn reputation by telling others how amazing that they themselves are. Um, social reputation is awarded to us by the community, not demanded of the community by us. So um, humility is important in that sense. It, it also ties into a notion of the social age of change. Historically, we've seen uh, a language, for example, soft skills and hard skills. That's the language that organisations often use. And there can be a sense of... Um, a sense of the fact that hard skills are vital, important, and really meaningful, and soft skills are nice to have around the edge of it. In a community context, that's probably not right. Within social leadership, uh, when we look at communities, and I'll, I'd refer you back to the earlier webinar on that, we see that um, in formal leadership spaces, we tend to take one role for a considerable period of time. In social spaces, we tend to take many different contextual roles. Um, and and that uh, that can really be um, quite uh, important. So on any one day, you may take different roles within different um, communities. So understanding roles within communities is important. Um, Antonia is just asking, do you have any tips for understanding an etiquette within a closed community? Well, that's it's a very good question. I'll try to keep an answer to it fairly brief. Um, uh, I'll, firstly, I'll refer you to uh, a recent piece of writing I've been doing, which is about conditions for community. And that looks at 16 different conditions that may need to be met for community to emerge. Um, in a sort of ethnographic context, one would say uh, the best tip to understanding the etiquette of a community is to observe is to uh, immerse yourself in the community, but to do so with a humility to, to wait and to listen and to learn. Um, well, that's good if you have high social capital and if you're confident to do that. Um, but it may be a two-sided uh, feature. A community 
which is looking um, to grow may need to actively consider how to empower and nurture and develop individuals who are uh, coming into that space but individually part of our social capital is to develop that capability to tune into different communities and again i'll refer you back to the earlier webinar on community or if, if you're if you're looking along in the book to the the the, the pages um uh, the chapter around community and um there i look at the different purposes of community because in some communities we may only ever be observing um, so our etiquette may be very sort of easy to understand because we're just listening and absorbing. But in some communities, we, we may need to be challenging or we may, we may be helping to tell a story or helping to co-create or sense make or find meaning. And in that context, we, need, we do need to be able to tune in. It's likely to be a combination of observation, but then crucially, um, we need to be rehearsing and prototyping new behaviours. So to really understand etiquette, we have to rehearse and prototype. Um, and to do that requires a trust into the community um, and a tolerance on the part of the community towards us, which is, um, which is interesting. There's one final point on this, which I just wanted to, uh, to, to mention, which is that um, the etiquette of communities can be very contextual. So it's not that it's one fixed and solid notion that we have to uncover. We may also need to understand the context of the etiquette. And again, I'll, I'll just refer you to some uh, recent uh, writing on that, which is um, I, I, I was writing a week or two ago about the, uh, the challenges in uh, Charlottesville, about the, um, the cultural context of the civil uh, unrest and quest for social justice and specifically um, exploring the um, narratives of power and the example that I used there is of the statues uh, the statues of civil war leaders that have stood in those communities for maybe 150 200 years now for all that time they've had a very low level of attributed context the statues have just been a backdrop to what's happened as the social context changes, a new attribution is imposed onto those statues. They become totems of, um, uh, of, of civil unrest. They become uh, something which is unacceptable within a society. And that's quite interesting. There's nothing that's physically changed about the statue. It's purely the socially attributed uh, context which has evolved. So I share that just to mention, it's not about understanding one set of rules um, for one community. It's very much understanding the, the fluidity of, of way in which those are applied. But humility is a, a, a good foundation for that. Um, I thought I'd put this slide in around um, the action day. So if, um, uh, if any of you are, are, are following along in the 100 days book, and I know that one or two of you are, uh, you'll have seen that every 10th day is an action day. It's an encouragement to get out and do something in the community. The reason I, I put the slide in here, actually, is because social capital is very much about action. Um, and again, I'll refer you back to that, that earliest definition I, I gave at the start. So on the one hand, my own ability to survive and thrive is an aspect of my social capital, but my ability to help others to survive and thrive is an equally important aspect. And indeed, my ability to help my organisation achieve a social uh, balance and fairness and achieve social justice is is an important part of it if i only focus on myself um, then i'm probably not truly developing social capital or not not truly being a, a social leader in that broadest sense so i think it's good to have a reminder um, that this is about action now i, I just want to come on to um, a fairly obvious i guess um, aspect of social capital which is about equality and I'm unafraid to, to admit, you know, I, I tend to put personally a stronger um, emphasis on this than, than perhaps one has to. Uh, that's, uh, you know, that may be a liberal tendency, but also uh, because, you know, I think that this, this fight for equality is, is really a fight of our times. And, um, and, and so why, well, for obvious reasons, it's important in social leadership. You, you, you may get away with being a formal leader without paying 
uh, due concern towards equality and, and maybe we're seeing some of that playing out in, in our global political systems today. Um, but as an individual within a community, uh, we really do have to fight to hear all the voices, not just because it's the right thing to do and we need to stand up for what's right, but really because if we don't hear all those voices, if not everybody has an equal voice, then we cannot hope to have a broad and diversified sense-making capability. Remember, the point of social leadership isn't to hear voices of consensus, it's to be able to engage with and learn from voices of dissent. So if one tried to reduce this to the cold hard language of business, we might say it's, it's a competitive advantage to have a more diverse and equal community. Um, absolutely, as uh, Hilton says, consider those not at the table, absolutely. If we don't hear all the voices, then we can't possibly be strong. In fact, uh, I'm very interested at the moment in, in aspects of confirmation bias, which is the, the view by which we formulate an opinion, and then we hear those things which confirm the opinion we already have. Um, there's great value in, in hearing different voices and actively seeking out different voices. Um, the corollary of that is ensuring that nobody is left voiceless, uh, that nobody is left uh, without a voice. And, and people can be left voiceless for many different reasons. I mentioned earlier legal, moral and ethical differences. So in some cultures, women have a quieter voice than men because they're not granted a permission. Um, and there's a high social consequence of claiming a permission uh, to use the voice. And I, I felt this very acutely when um, I was uh, able to present some of the, this work in Riyadh in Saudi Arabia last year. And um, uh, on the one hand, I, I felt uh, a great benefit to be able to uh, share ideas in a, in a culture where different views um, around equality and the, the role of, of women in society, particularly uh, health. Um, but I was very struck by the fact that as I was presenting, on, on the day that I was presenting, at the time that I was presenting, um, a 20-year-old young lady in the same city was arrested for Instagramming a photograph of herself not wearing a headscarf. Um, now, she did so as a deliberate act of defiance, but of course, any of my friends in the UK can Instagram all the photos that they like of themselves, uh, with or without a headscarf, um, with no fear of consequence whatsoever. So that young lady was facing consequence, not because uh, she didn't lose the voice because she lacked a skill or capability to project her voice to be heard in the world. Her voice was actively taken away from her um, through... Uh, that moral, legal, ethical system that she existed within. So people can be left voices because they are deliberately disqualified for that. Now, that's not just about cultural differences. It can be about all sorts of differences. We may accidentally end up just listening to the voice of those people who speak with the most confidence. We may lose weak voices within the system. And that, again, can be important. I was working with one of the, the real biggest technology companies in the world recently, and they... Uh, I heard a senior leader say, I only want to hear your good ideas. You know, he said those words, I only want to hear your good ideas, as if he were the, the, the arbiter of what was a good idea. There's no attempt in that context to use social filtering mechanisms to understand what, um, to understand, uh, you know, how do we find a good idea? If we just rely on the people with formal power to be the arbiters of whether an idea is good or not, we'll just hear the ideas that we want to hear. So there's a, there's a social cost, a social consequence of failing to fight for fairness, equality and inclusion. But there's also a very straightforward business cost. You can run all the innovation programs you like. You can talk about agile all you like. But if you don't hear all the voices and discern an ability to hear weak voices within the system, then we can never be truly innovative and to change. Um, uh, and sorry, Hilton, I'm not sure I quite understand the context of your question. Perhaps if you, if you um, just give me slightly more context on that, and then I'll, I'll come back to it in a moment, if uh, if you could. Um, so uh, feedback is uh, an interesting part of it, uh, and again, for probably fairly predictable. Uh, part of hearing stories of difference may involve uh, a confidence and a capability to go out and ask for feedback around that. Um, and this is about um, something I've been working on actually since publishing the book, which is about story listening. Um, there's very often a tendency within formal power structures, even really good, well-intentioned, well-meaning ones, 
for formal leaders to respond to social stories. So people say, well, I think this, I heard this, this is a story I want to share. And formal leaders respond to that by saying, well, that's great, and this is what we're doing about it. Or I hear you, and this is the context around that. They feel a need to respond. Um, whilst in fact, sometimes we need to just take that feedback. We just need to listen to the stories and thank people for the stories. Um, and that can be actually quite a hard skill. I'm mentoring the chief executive of uh, one of the big um, aerospace companies at the moment about developing his social leadership. And he's very interesting. He's a, a really incredible leader. Uh, I don't say that lightly. I, I'm lucky enough to meet many different people around the world. And he's one of the top leaders I've ever met, I would say. He's very much respected and liked by um, the people I've met within his team. Uh, however, uh, he, he's not good at listening to stories without feeling the need to respond because it moves him out of his traditional space of power and understanding. And that's quite um, interesting. How do we become good at listening, at garnering feedback, but doing so in a way where we don't feel the need to um, respond directly to it. So um, this is a, a notion of, of social capital, um, a, a, the reflective notion, I guess, um, about being attuned to our communities, about hearing both the formal conversations and social conversations. So our greatest skill becomes one of listening, not one of talking, not one about sharing our own view. It's about listening and tuning in uh, to the views of the community, about hearing all those voices within the system. Now, this, uh, again, I'll refer you back to some of the earlier work on community, because if we are just tuned into a small number of communities, those that we know about and those who agree with us broadly, then we may be just reinforcing our own confirmation bias. Um, so we may actively need to reach out and seek communities of dissent and difference. So communities where we are fairly sure we won't agree with what's being said, but reach into those spaces with a humility to listen and learn. Now that can be difficult because um, we, of course, align a lot of our, our, our own sense of purpose and well-being with our views and the validity of our views. So to move into communities which we agree with less can be a very uh, emotionally challenging thing to do. But it makes us strongest leaders if we are able to engage in that way. Um, this uh, is a new slide which uh, is um, really uh, trying to draw a bit of a link between uh, two pieces of work between social capital work and between some work I'll actually publish uh, later in the year on uh, organizational change and um, it, it really is this call to account so it relates back into the action day uh, aspect really of uh, not just observing change happening um, we need to be an, an active part of that change uh, and you remember I said earlier, to stand up, to, to make a difference. Um, it's very easy to be a, um, a, a passive um, observer of change. Uh, we can agree with it, we can, we can support it, uh, but uh, a key part of social leadership is standing up and taking action uh, within it. Now, let me just uh, re read the question here. So the example I gave of a person being rejected, we would appear to see her choice is increasing social capital, um, others may not, therefore a currency issue. Um, I, uh, if, I, if I understand the, the question correctly, um, Hilton, it may be, um, it, may, it may be that we're, we're, uh, we're talking about, you know, how do we involve people with different perspectives, different ideas around it, if I, I'll sort of answer it in that, in that context, um, which uh, to me is about, uh, this notion of willful blindness of organisations if they um, choose to hear the views of those that they wish to hear but don't necessarily wish to hear the views of those that, where they don't agree with the, the outlying um, fundamental premise of it. And, and I think that ties into that notion of charting stories of difference, something which social leaders would, would certainly um, seek to do. The bias... Um, in our views is a, a really um, important perspective, I think. And uh, this slide I've actually um, uh, brought in from an earlier webinar. It's, it's one about uh, the question that's asked around this is, is where are your 
libraries? Where is your knowledge? And it's really intended to be about where is the community that you build around you? Um, so we know that when people form social groups, when they form their social networks, we often tend to form those of people somewhat in our own image. Uh, that may be our own image in terms of um, uh, obvious views of diversity. So we tend to engage more readily with people who kind of look like us, sound like us, agree with us. Um, it may be about that notion of views. It may be about age. Um, it, there's often a certain conformity within that. Now that can be sort of wonderfully liberating to work in a tightly coherent community where people agree strongly with us. But in the notion of social capital, um, we may realise that we're just working within a subset of, of the wider community. So we have to start again by looking inwards towards our own bias. Are we just drawing upon certain sources of information? Are we relying on our tried and tested ways of doing things rather than giving ourselves space to learn and rehearse and prototype? And this really is the deeply reflective nature of a, a social leadership journey and indeed why nobody can award you social um, leadership from an organisational perspective because only you yourself can really truly judge. Am I open to new ideas and opinions? It's very easy to claim an oppositional type of power where we say well I am against the things that you say and against the things that you think. Um, it's much harder to gain a consensus type of power where we say I hear your view, I understand your view and indeed I'm willing to change my view but we have to find a shared and unified, a co-created um, space going forward. That's really why I've put um, collaboration as the final step of social leadership, it's collaboration, as this ability to, to co-create and, and, and share stories is, um, is particularly important. So um, you know, how do we accommodate voices that reject, um, that, that reject or attempt to resonate? Well, there's always um, a challenge, I guess. Uh, the nature of communities is to be fluid and the nature of the forces that bond communities together um, is fluid. In the trust research, we look at the contextual nature of trust. Uh, so to give you a sense of that, um, the best description I can give you of what trust is, is to consider it as a basket of separate forces which focus in and come together sometimes uh, agreeing with each other, sometimes opposed to each other. And if you're forced to make a decision, do I trust or accept this view or not? We sort of screenshot it and say in this moment, in this context, at this time, this is how I feel. But these are complex subjective social forces which are subject to, um, to movement over time. So um, on the one hand, we need to hear these different views. On the other hand, we still have to take decisions. There are still times when we have to be able to come down and say, I agree with you, I don't agree with you. This is what we'll do, this is what we won't do. So really, in, I guess in some ways we could say what we're seeking to do is to become more mindful in our efforts to do that. We need to uh, look individually, internally, to understand our biases and preconceptions, the uniformity of our community, um, our ability to survive and thrive in this new ecosystem and our ability to help others to do so. And we also need to look um, externally at that wider community around us to understand um, the social context um, and fairness of what is being done. And then we need to take some steps and make some decisions and do something. But we continually come back to that reflective space. That's why social leadership is a journey. It's why the language around all of my work is of exploration and reflection, and indeed why my own work is, is iterative and evolving in the context of working out loud. So one of the pieces which is quite important around this is social authority. And the reason I say it's important is because there's a strong likelihood as a social leader that we will make mistakes because we're not operating with a known clear space with known and clear rules. It's only by having high social authority, that reputation based authority, which is granted to us by the system, that we will have the confidence and capability 
to explore and share those ideas, to be able to have the conversation within um, our communities around what we think, to have a humility to say, I'm not yet clear what I think. If you look at our own political systems, it's very rare that a lead, I was working actually with the federal government in Canada last uh, week, or a week before last, sorry, and, uh, and, and I talked about this with them. How often as a leader, a political leader, do you feel able to say, I, I'm really not sure what I think about this at the moment, or I've changed my mind what I think about this at the moment because I've considered some new evidence. There's a new context around it. The reality is we grant our leaders a very low permission to experiment and explore. As social leaders, we need to earn our high social authority to have that permission to experiment and, and explore. Indeed, possibly, in the context of the social age, where knowledge itself is changing, often to be more emergent, reflective, co-created, it will become a new differentiating skill, your ability to change your mind, to do so mindfully, to do so fairly, becomes a, a really valuable trait. I'm really fascinated myself about this link between reputation and social authority. Um, it's almost my favorite part of the social leadership equation because it's, it's really where the magic happens. It's as we move to suddenly discover that we have the support of our community around us. It gives us that ability to experiment. I thought I'd just um, wrap it up and we'll have a bit of time for questions at the end to talk about the, the, the context of the, the whole model. And again, as with all my work, I say this is my sketch of social leadership, but you may want to sketch it differently. You may, you may not think some of these pieces are relevant and I'd encourage you to, to do that. My narrative of social leadership is this, we start with curation about choosing a space, about thinking what do I want to be known for, where will I be based. This isn't forever, this is about the foundation of our journey. Social leaders understand how stories work. Stories are the, tr the mechanism of transmission of cultural knowledge. They're, they're carried across different layers in different ways. Formal stories, co-created collaborative stories, deeply personal and individual stories understanding how those stories work and crucially how they battle up against each other um, which is part of what uh, what Hilton's been asking about here you know how do different stories fight each other and they do fight each other they fight each other for dominance this notion and narrative coming out of uh, the United States particularly at the moment around fake news is really one of competing narratives um, and about the social force behind each of them it's not necessarily about evidence it's quite an interesting thing you see that um, people rarely base, change their view based on evidence. They, they change their view based on feeling, on emotion. Um, so we have to understand how stories work and how they're shared. And when we share, we must share to add signal, not just add noise into the system. These are the foundational skills. Then we have to understand where are our communities. And as I referred to earlier, the different purpose of those communities and the roles that we take within it, not just our formal communities, but our social ones. Then understand through our actions how we earn reputation and that magical step from reputation through to authority. And I, I suppose it's not a very business-like thing to say that there's magic in the equation. It's certainly not a very scientific thing to say, but it's an interesting piece. It's an interesting part of an individual journey as well to discover, to unearth and surface the support of your community around you. With that social authority, we can achieve effects at scale. We can engage in co-creation. We can address this question of social capital, not purely our own, but developing social capital in others, holding other people safe and doing so without any expectation of reciprocity in the moment is the mark of a social leader engaged in and investing in others, not for reward, not for tangible reward, not for um, immediate transactional reward, not even with a cast iron guarantee of deferred reward, but doing so because it's the right thing to do, which ties in closely to reputation. And then collaboration, and collaboration is what I'll explore um, in detail uh, on the next webinar, which will come up in, um, in October, we'll, we'll consider all aspects of collaboration. We've got uh, a few minutes for questions. If anybody has any thoughts or questions they'd like to type in whilst you're doing that, I'll just mention a couple of other things. The, um, the 100 Days book is, is out now. It's this guided 100 day journey through social leadership. Some of you may be, uh, may be on that. If you're interested in that work, um, 
do uh, just drop me a note and I'll happily send you a, a copy over. Something else which will be out in the next month or so is the Trust Sketchbook. I've talked about trust a little bit and the Trust Sketchbook is going to be a guided reflection around trust. So if you're interested in that, uh, do stay engaged around the trust work. I, I'm personally finding it absolutely fascinating um, at the moment. So I'll leave you with the with contact details there. And um, I'll hand back to Sam for questions um, or any thoughts at the end of the session. Thank you very much, Julian. That's a, a, a really interesting walk through a, a slightly complex uh, element of the social leadership model, uh, but a really important and, and deep one. Every time I consider it myself, I find new things in there. Uh, and also a great reminder that I'm looking forward to receiving my own copy of the Trust Sketchbook soon. So really looking forward to that. Um, we haven't had any questions through at the minute, um, but um, so if you do have a question, please do feel free to um, add this into the, the chat window there. Uh, of course, if you have a, a question, you can reach out to Julian on uh, Twitter. And my, one of the crew, my CSOC crew mates, will be in touch um, after this session uh, to share information about how you can access this video, which will be on YouTube, along with all of the previous other uh, webinars that we've recorded so far uh, that Julian's hosted for us. Um, in terms of the next webinar, so this is the collaboration webinar, that's actually going to be happening on the 3rd of October, uh, and that's 2 p.m. UK time. So if you're interested, please feel free to uh, go onto the csotlearning.com website and you'll be able to, from the events section there, find the link to sign up uh, to be reminded for this webinar. And I have had a couple of questions, Julian, there from Hilton. Uh, first question is, uh, let me just scan through this. Just caught up. Realised component eight was in the book. Yes. Uh, does this work imply a social capital exchange process? Well, I, I, I personally don't uh, buy into notions of the currency of social capital. I don't think it's transactional like that. I think it's useful to think about it in terms of, uh, in terms of developing social capital, but it's not a currency-based approach. The same with trust, naturally. There's, there's quite a lot of work around the currency of trust. And similarly, I, I, I prefer um, to view these things as quite, quite multi-dimensional, uh, so not as a straightforward as one simple uh, currency. So not a straightforward transactional process. And again, if you're interested in that, just if you search on the blog for the currency of trust, you'll see some writing on that. And I'm just sharing some new parts of the research as we're doing the analysis now around that. Excellent. Okay. okay cool. Thank, thank you for that. Thank you everybody very much for joining today and uh, stay in touch all right thank you very much julian and once again and thank you to everybody as julian said uh, if you want to find out anything more about julian then please do get in touch and we'll be happy to send any information your way hope to see you again soon thank you julian once again thank you everyone thanks everyone bye bye, -bye.